So ultrasound of the elbow. Um, the elbow is a, is a very complex joint, uh, which is prone to injury. But because all the structures in the elbow are so superficial, it is very amenable to ultrasound examination. The subjects that we're going to cover uh, this, after uh, this afternoon are the anatomy, uh, the technique of scanning the elbow, and then the various pathological conditions. And I'm going to divide um, the lecture into problems of the joint, problems of the tendon, uh, the bursae, uh, the ligaments, uh, and the nerves. And so I'm going to start off with the uh, joint. Um, and the three main um, conditions that uh, we'll be looking at are the detection of effusions and synovitis, uh, and also of the loose bodies. So to examine the elbow joint um, anteriorly, um, we, what we want to see is the radiocapitella joint uh, as our first landmark. That's the easiest place to orientate yourself when you're looking at the elbow. And this is an extended field of view image. You can see the hubris on the left side of the image, the, uh, the radial uh, head and the proximus, uh, proximal radius. Uh, you can see the radial capitella joint. Um, the uh, capitella uh, is, is as um, demonstrated over here. And you can see the coronoid fossa um, with echogenic fat within the coronoid fossa. Remember, on an X-ray, if you have a joint effusion, that fat is pushed anteriorly, which gives us elevation of the fat pad. Um, and so, uh, what we're looking for is, uh, for an effusion, is fluid that lies beneath um, the uh, uh, fat pad over here. We can then look at the elbow joint posteriorly, Again, an extended field of image here, uh, showing the olecranon. Notice the position of the patient. It's what we call the crack position. So the, the patient uh, has that elbow kind of bent up. And using uh, jelly uh, at the end of the probe, you can see how we can get good visualization um, as it comes around the corner. And you can see the olecranon um, and the olecranon fossa. And remember, the olecranon fossa as well should be full of fat, um, and you can see the triceps tendon inserting uh, onto the uh, olecranon. And you see the arrow there points to the, um, uh, the fat in the olecranon fossa. So that's the posterior fat pad. So these are the these are the conditions that we see um, related to the joint. So a joint effusion, um, synovitis, and loose bodies. Remember, if you see a joint effusion, it is a non-specific finding. So it can be there because of inflammation, but it could be because of infection. So it may be that if we see an effusion, we need to perform uh, an aspiration to make the diagnosis. And you can see that this is an anterior view showing the uh, radiocapitella joint. And anteriorly, uh, the arrows show the hypoechoic uh, effusion, um, which um, uh, is, is present over here. Again, another effusion. There's the bones that are outlined, uh, and the arrows point towards the effusion. Posteriorly, uh, we can see that um, the olecranon fossa normally has fat within it and that fat pad uh, has been displaced uh, because of the fluid in the joint. And this is the safest uh, place to um, perform uh, an aspiration of the elbow joint because there are no important structures here to damage. So if I want to put a needle into the joint, I use a posterior approach. So, when I see an effusion, there's a big differential. It may be because of infection. It may be because of inflammation, such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it could be post-traumatic, so it could be a hemorrhage, but it could be um, also some uh, interesting conditions, such as uh, pigmented villanodular synovitis, uh, what we describe as PVNS, 
for another condition called synovial osteochondromatosis, uh, where there's loose bodies in the joint. And there are certain features that we can use to try and help us um, determine if an infusion is simple or complex, whether there are solid uh, tissues within the infusion, uh, whether it's echogenic, whether I can see a Doppler signal uh, within the infusion or loose bodies. And this is an example of um, synovitis in the uh, olecranon fossa, and you can see that the um, there's echogenic material within the shoulder, uh, within the elbow, with um, increased vascularity. And so if you put the needle into this, you're unlikely to be able to draw off any fluid. This is an example of uh, synovial osteochondromatosis, where um, the patients have a thickening of the synovium, and they form loose bodies within the joint. And you can see here, that's your macronal fossa, and these echogenic loose bodies are seen uh, lying posteriorly uh, within the extended joint. As I said, this is the approach I would use for uh, obtaining fluid from the joint uh, if I wanted to draw fluid on it. Loose bodies uh, are common within the elbow, and often they are post-traumatic but they can be related to osteoarthritis and also uh, synovial proliferative diseases. And the loose bodies may be comprised of cartilage, bone, uh, fibrosis, and patients will present with pain and locking. Loose bodies will typically look echogenic with posterior acoustic shadowing. And sometimes performing an arthrogram uh, may help make the diagnosis. And you can see here, um, uh, loose body is sitting within the fossa with posterior acoustic shadowing. This is an example of a patient uh, who had a loose body uh, within the um, coronoid fossa anteriorly. You can see the equivalent um, MRI scan of this patient. And one thing that uh, ultrasound doesn't allow you to evaluate nicely is the actual surface uh, uh, contour of the, of the joint. So uh, because this is slightly away from the, the superficial aspect of the bone, um, we couldn't see the, um, the, the defect of the cathelum from which uh, the loose body has arisen from. So ultrasound does have its limitations when it comes to assessing uh, the elbow joint. We're moving on now to uh, the tendons and uh, the conditions that we're going to talk about are uh, tennis elbow, um, tears of the triceps, and also tears of the biceps tendon. In terms of the anatomy, think about the elbow as four different compartments. You've got anteriorly, the biceps and brachialis tendons, posteriorly, the triceps, laterally, the common extensor origin, and medially, the common flexor origin. The common extensor origin is a very important structure because many patients uh, suffer from tennis elbow. So this is uh, the longitudinal view of the common extensor um, tendon here. Um, and we can see that it attaches uh, to the lateral epicondyle and it should have a nice fibrillar structure um, and we can identify um, uh, the, uh, the, the radius and the distal humerus here. And if you look closely, you can see a structure that is got fibers that are traveling in a different direction. Um, and uh, that represents the uh, collateral ligament, uh, the, the lateral collateral ligament of the wrist, of, of, of the elbow. Um, and uh, you can see that lies deep to the common extensor origin. In tennis elbow, uh, this is a term that we use for patients who have uh, tendinosis of the common extensor origin. And in around a third of patients, we can see tears uh, of the uh, tendon that are associated with this tendinosis. And when I perform ultrasound, it's very important that we use Doppler um, in conjunction uh, with the 
examination because what we will see in patients who have a painful tennis elbow is that there will be increased vascularity on Doppler. Um, a normal tendon should have no vascularity within it. And you can see here, uh, again, the radiocapitella joint, there's the common extensor origin, um, there's alternate and increased vascularity. Again, with the beauty of um, ultrasound is that we have the other side to compare with. So always take the opportunity to look at the normal anatomy if you can. Uh, it may be that the patient has bilateral symptoms, but in, in many patients, it's only on one side that they have symptoms. So compare what you think is an abnormality with the normal side. This is very important when you're learning to perform ultrasound. And you can see here swelling, loss of architecture, and um, uh, decreased echogenicity. On the other side of the elbow, on the medial aspect, you have the common flexor origin, and that is prone to developing golfer's elbows. So tennis elbows on the outside, golfer's elbows on the inside. And you can see here a hypochoic region uh, within the tendon uh, with some increased vascularity on Doppler. At the posterior aspects of the um, elbow, we have the uh, triceps insertion, um, and most of the problems in the triceps will occur as it attaches to the bone. Um, and you can see here uh, a patient with on an MRI uh, showing uh, triceps tendinosis, uh, but there's also a lot of stress change uh, within the olecranon and the skirt sequence. And in patients um, who have triceps tendinosis, what we expect to see is loss of the normal uh, fibrillar pattern of the tendon with uh, low echogenicity and um, increased vascularity. And sometimes you may see a bony spur such as this. Um, and you can see um, uh, the thickening um, and longitudinal split within the distal tendon. You can see here um, increased vascularity. Uh, there's that bony spur that you can see on x ray. Sometimes uh, in elderly patients or in patients who are using steroids, um, you might see uh, a rupture of the triceps tendon. Um, and usually, clinically, this is quite obvious with a gap felt. But you can see here retraction uh, of the tendon away from the uh, insertion of the electron. Let's look now at the biceps tendon. This is a difficult structure to examine on ultrasound because it's a very thin tendon uh, and it's prone to uh, the artifact of anisotropy. And what we should be able to see is a nice uh, fibrillar structure um, that attaches uh, to the radial tubercle. Again, I've outlined the anatomy here. You can see that the brachial vessels lie anterior to the long head of biceps. And uh, as we scan through longitudinally, the arrows point to the long head of biceps uh, anterior to the brachial vessels. And you can see that this is the insertion is actually some distance from the actual radial head itself. So the radial tubercle is uh, a few centimeters away from the joint. Again, we see the Popeye sign already. Uh, and again, uh, with disruptions either at the top end of the biceps or at the lower end of the biceps you can have uh, this uh, retraction of the muscle belly. And this is an example here on MRI showing the ends of the tendon uh, very nicely uh, pulled back here uh, with uh, loss of tension within the long head of, head of biceps. And there is a structure called the insertus fibrosis which um, normally keeps the, the tendon in place uh, at the lower end. And if this is also disrupted, then you can have this uh, retraction at the Popeye side. And this looks like a very complicated image. I'm going to put the anatomy in again. You can see the coronoid fossa anteriorly, uh, the radius, um, and what I'm expecting to see is biceps tendon in this region. You can see fluid uh, in the gap over here uh, and the retracted uh, muscle belly. Again, another example here. There's a humerus there. 
that's where the rail of head would be. And you can see the gap with this very marked retraction uh, of the biceps tendon. And yet another example over here. Uh, all of these are done with extended field of view images um, uh, to show the abnormality. This is an example of uh, a patient uh, with an intact uh, Lacertus fibrosis. I mean, this is a structure that keeps the tendon um, in place. Uh, so that's normal. And this is a patient with a, a, a high grade partial tear at the insertion. So you can see that there's laxity of the tendon uh, with a hypochoic line down here uh, because uh, the tendon is disrupted. But because the insertus fibrosis is intact, there is no retraction uh, of that uh, biceps tendon. Perhaps the, another very good way of looking at the biceps tendon is with the elbow flex. And we know from MRI what we call the FAMX position uh, that we can see the long head biceps attaching to the, um, uh, the radial tuberosity. And you can see outlined over here, there's the tendon. And we can get a similar appearance if we scan the patient with the uh, elbow flex. And so you can see here um, the uh, biceps tendon, uh, very similar to the MRI. Uh, and this is a good position uh, for, for looking uh, for the integrity of the tendon. Uh, and this is an example of uh, someone who has a disrupted, long, uh, a disrupted biceps tendon. And that's where it should be attaching. And there's a gap. Uh, up to the retracted tendon. I'm moving on now to the bursae, and the bursae are basically fluid-filled sacs which help um, uh, anatomical structures glide um, over each other. And uh, we have one around the distal biceps tendon and also uh, at the posterior aspect of the elbow. And we know that the bicipitoradial bursa sits between the biceps tendon and radius and allows a smooth gliding of the biceps tendon as we pronate and supinate our forearm. And you can see here on uh, MRI, if you have a uh, bicipitoradial bursitis, um, it doesn't fully surround the distal tendon, uh, unlike the tendon sheath. Um, but uh, the tendon lies at one side of it. Um, and you can see the fluid signal, uh, fluid distension of this. And often, if you do have fluid distending the bicycle radial bursa, it's because you have a, a tear of the biceps tendon. And you can see the distended bursa here, and a similar appearance um, on uh, ultrasound. And it may be that in certain conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis, you have a bursa that is um, uh, distended, but there is um, uh, solid material there because of uh, synovial hypertrophy. And it's important not to uh, mistake this uh, for uh, a tumor around the, uh, uh, the biceps tendon. Again, another example here of a distended biceps or radial bursa with synovial hypertrophy. And this was the MRI in that patient. Um, showing the uh, synovitis around the tendon, uh, which is partly torn. Electrolombocytis is a, is a common condition uh, where, whereby you have distension of the bursa and sometimes it can become infected um, and become very swollen like this. And we're often asked to look at it to make sure that there is no involvement of the elbow joint because uh, this is normally just an extra articular uh, condition uh, uh, and the joint is not involved. And usually when we see inflammation of the bursa, it is with uh, synovial hypertrophy rather than fluid. So usually it's not fluid distension, usually it's kind of thickened material uh, that is filling the molecular like, bursa, as you can see in this patient. But this is an example here uh, of uh, a bursa that is fluid filled um, overlying the triceps of the electron. 
And rarely in conditions such as gout, um, you can have um, calcification in the birth cell, uh, as you can see in this patient. Um, uh, when we did the uh, ultrasound examination, we noticed there was a lot of epigenic material there. So x-ray uh, was performed, which uh, confirmed the presence of calcification. Moving on to the ligaments. Uh, uh, injuries of the radial collateral ligament and the ulnar collateral ligament uh, are important to be able to detect on uh, an ultrasound examination. The lateral collateral ligament, or, or the radial collateral ligament as it's also called, is a complex structure which has three main components. Um, and uh, they are shown here as the radial collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, um, and in the, in the red is the annular ligament. And we know that the radial collateral ligament attaches to the annular ligament. And on MRI, we can see it as a nice kind of structure uh, extending down deep to the uh, common extensor origin. Uh, and again, on uh, ultrasound, uh, it's a similar appearance. Um, and so you can see part of the way in which you can learn to do ultrasound if, if you're doing MRI examinations is to compare um, imaging uh, between the two modalities, especially if it's available for that patient. So it's, if you have done an MRI scan and you have prior imaging on the patient, you can compare that imaging uh, on ultrasound uh, that will allow you to learn. And you can see here uh, the structures uh, are very similar, but ultrasound actually gives you better resolution. Lateral collateral ligament injury is um, common with dislocations of the elbow joint and it's associated with tears of the common extensor origin or patients who've had surgery for tennis elbow. And if you have um, injury to these structures, then you can get uh, uh, instability of the radial pad. There it is on MRI. And this is um, the appearance uh, of a lateral collateral ligament injury or tear in a patient who has um, tennis elbow. You can see marked vascularity uh, in the proximal tendon. The ulnar collateral ligament um, is particularly common in countries where there are a lot of throwing sports. So in the medical literature in America, um, these injuries are very commonly seen because uh, of um, uh, the throwing sports such as baseball and basketball and American football. Um, and what this represents is a valgus uh, injury uh, with the um, uh, elbow infection. And what we can see here is the normal anatomy of the ulnar collateral ligament um, on MRI with the black band. And this is an example of a disruption of the ulnar collateral ligament on MRI. And this is a normal appearance um, uh, in, uh, in a young patient. Um, and this is the other side of that patient's uh, anatomy. And you can see that there is, a, there is a tear of the uh, proximal portion uh, of the ulnar collateral ligament. And ultrasound also allows us to examine the elbow dynamically. You can see here, because the ligament is damaged, uh, the joint widens up when we stress the joint. And so this is information which uh, we cannot obtain uh, from doing an MRI scan. Um, and um, we know that uh, uh, ultrasound uh, is very good for examining the joints because we have this ability to examine dynamically. And the final topic uh, when it comes to the elbow is going to be the nerves. And I'm going to talk about the ulnar nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the radial nerve. So as you know, there's three main bundles of nerves that cross the elbow. And the important ones uh, for the elbow are the radial and the ulnar nerves. So the ulnar nerve um, uh, sits where your funny bone is at the posterior aspect of the elbow. Um, in the cubital groove. And you have the medial condyle shown here. 
this structure over here and transverse plane with what I describe as a salt and pepper appearance, so it's got a speckled appearance, uh, is the ulnar nerve, and it sits uh, within the groove, um, triceps on one side, and it should be the same thickness in the longitudinal plane uh, as you look longitudinally uh, at that structure. In some patients uh, who have ulnar nerve problems, they can uh, present with um, uh, ulnar nerve symptoms in the uh, little and ring fingers, uh, as shown. And it may be that there is a space occupying lesion. You can see this patient has a ganglion within the groove that's compressing the ulnar nerve. But as well as that, uh, in some patients, the problem can be because of uh, a subluxing ulnar nerve with impingement of that nerve. Um, and the normal nerve should look echogenic like this, and the abnormal nerve here, you can see, has a hypoechoic appearance. And when you look longitudinally, you can see that the nerve is thickened uh, towards the right side of the screen. Uh, so that represents a uh, 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 an ulnar nerve that uh, is affected uh, uh, by uh, ulnar neuritis. Again, another example here. And in this patient here, you can see a nerve, as the patient uh, flexes their arm, that the nerve is wanting to sublux. And ulnar nerve subluxation may be seen in up to 10 or 15 percent of uh, normal um, People. So you can see here, there's the uh, ulnar nerve, and in this patient, it's going to go, it's gone across. Um, and the patient may be able to reproduce this for you um, and um, kind of show you uh, at what point uh, it's going to go across. The radial nerve, um, as it crosses around the uh, uh, distal uh, humerus, uh, gives off a branch uh, called the posterior interosseous nerve uh, that pierces the supinator muscle. And this is an important branch of the radial nerve because it, uh, it affects uh, motor function. And if you speak to your orthopedic surgeons, uh, when it comes to fixing uh, fractures of the, um, the radial head and neck or putting in metal work in this region for patients who have uh, fractures, um, this is a, an important nerve for them to identify and it can get injured uh, quite easily uh, in trauma. When we're looking transversely at the nerve um, in the uh, upper arm, it lies between the brachioradialis and the brachialis muscles. And then as you come down to the elbow, um, it lies close to the radial head and then you can see it piercing the supinator muscle. So this is actually a relatively easy structure uh, to be able to visualize the you know, anatomy. And we can get impression of the nerve um, in a trauma, but as well as that, uh, in patients who have a ganglion or synovitis or a tumor. You can see that this patient has a ganglion arising from the radiocapitella joint. There's this patient's ultrasound examination that was done before the MRI scan. And you can see the, the comparative anatomy and how it looks exactly the same ultrasound, so the ultrasound took two minutes to perform, the MRI took 45 minutes to perform. So to conclude, when you look at the elbow, it is a systematic approach. Uh, beware of the various indications. Usually if your clinician asks for an elbow examination, it's for a very specific question. The question will be, is there tennis elbow? Is there an infusion? Is there a biceps injury? So, even though the elbow seems like a complicated joint, most of the time when you're performing an examination for the elbow, it's a very direct examination. And don't forget, MRI and ultrasound are complementary techniques. Okay, thank you for your attention.